Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, we are going to start in about five minutes because uh, we got pushed back a little further for some reason. I'm just kidding. It was just that starts at 9:25. Um, thank you to those in the back who set this all up. Uh, could we please give them a round of applause really quick? Because this is a lot of work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we will start in four minutes. Thank you. Hello? Oh, there it is. Okay, now, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, oh, that was me up there. Okay. Um, my name is Jeremiah Jimenez. I'm the uh, Shadow Dreams chairman this year. And again, thank you so much for coming to pick up your kids, because we don't want them anymore. Um, I wanted to kind of give a little context to the program. Um, 
the program is to kind of bring awareness, not kind of, it is to bring awareness to drinking and driving. Um, we do a multitude of things to try to bring that awareness to not only these group of students, but the whole student body at Birdville. Um, and a lot of work goes into it, and we're going to show you a video, um, and we're going to have a couple people come up and give a little bit more context on it. And I hope you enjoy. Um, before I start, I'd like to give a special thanks to a couple people who helped the program um, become what it was. Um, the Lucas Funeral Home, Bryce Kennedy Memorial, the NRH Police Officers Association, NRH Fire Department, Medical City North Hills, and CareFlight. Um, CareFlight was the people who brought the big old helicopter, so that was a, a nice show for the day. Um, and then I would also like to give a special shout out to the teacher, teachers and faculty, specifically Ms. Grossman over here, who is my like wing woman, you know, on the, on the right right here. Um, and just all that was possible today and yesterday is really truly because of her. So if we could give a big round of applause for her. Um, and also Ms. Fletcher, um, Ms. Oh, sorry. Um, Ms. Blankenship, yes, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Fletcher, Ms. Blankenship, and um, Ms. Hunter, yes, that was her name, sorry, I'm going blank, um, and uh, Officer Johns, uh, not Officer Johns, yeah, Officer Johns, right? Captain Johns, sorry, yeah. Um, so special thanks to all of them, and also Officer Qatar, who's over here. Um, he is our, remind me, what is it? it's not PA, or what is it? The SRO, that's what it is, yes. Um, so he's our officer on campus. Um, we all love him, he uh, creates a really, uh, fun and loving environment for all of us. Um, so if we could give a special round of applause for them as well. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to show the video next and I hope you enjoy. We're almost there. You don't need to be frustrated. I don't care what you do after. This is depressing. This one's all right. I wonder what's under there, though. That one's uh, pretty nice, right? Yeah. Uh, my name's Brady, by the way. Mark Lucas, right? nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, also, just so you know, there's nothing really in there. The bottom, that's just where the legs go. The idea is, Makes it nicer for viewing if just the upper half mm -hmm. of the torso or the or the deceased is showing. And uh, unfortunately, this is the only casket like this that we have. So you'll probably have to wait till your parents get back to decide if this is the model. Okay, yeah, they're just in the other room right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I have another family in another room there, but. Um, just see one of my associates when your parents get back and they'll be glad to help you. All right, thank All right. you. Sure. That was embarrassing. I need to get out of here. I promise I wasn't stalking. I just happened to be tapping through stories right when you post it. Anyways, there's this party tonight and I don't usually go, but Colin said he'd go with me if you want to also. Yeah, that sounds good. I really need distraction right now. What time? Colin's picking me up anyway, so we'll swing by at about eight. Cool. Yay. Two hour practice and now three hours of homework. Love it here. It's Friday. Let me text Caleb. There's this party tonight and I know you've been really stressed lately. I think we should go have some fun and unwind. You read my mind. I was just about to ask you if you wanted to go do something. Yeah, that sounds good. What time do you think we should go? Like 7.30? Yeah, I'll pick you up at 7.30. Maybe we can eat something before so it won't hit us so hard. That sounds good. Mansfield said something about Taco Bell in the hallway today, and that's all I've thought about. Wait, whose party is it? I'm not sure. Brady told me about it, and he said he's going, so... 
Mmm, okay. I'll see you at 7.30. This is exactly what I need. I'll do Ape's homework tomorrow. Hey, do you think you'll be okay tomorrow? Do you think your mom will notice? They'll never notice. All I have to do is walk in, say hi, and then go to my room. Alright, well let me know if you need anything. Don't forget, you're supposed to go to that A&M introduction thing tomorrow at 12. Please tell me that I can't, that I won't, that I fail, that I'll never make it out, yeah. Please tell me all the bad news are good, so my head full of every single doubt, yeah. Please say any negative thoughts, I pop off when I hear people say I cannot, I get off to the thought of proving everyone wrong, I won't stop to the top, so you better back off, I get lost. I'ma stay loud, stay proud, never running out, never heading south, I'll be spreading out, call it word of mouth, can't put me down, I'll be getting loud. Oh, it's your party? The one and only, I guess. Oh, that makes sense. It came from Claire. Yeah, I'm surprised Claire's even here, but I'm happy you guys are here. Are y'all talking about <sighs> I know you already know this, but we do have that big competition tomorrow, so I'm not going to drink and neither should you. Yes, Claire, I know I have responsibilities, but that's not going to stop me from having fun with all my friends. All right, let's dance. Say anything negative, because I just want to hear it out your mouth, yeah. Give me tool, it's a tool that I use to go ahead and run my mouth, yeah. I take shots, I take loss, I make shots, I miss lots. I tell you get big box, you get yachts, you swing lots, and pop off a big shot. I ain't done chasing, got Hey, I know we still have 10 minutes left, but I think it's about time to get out of here. It'll take a while to get him out. Yeah, probably. Hey, man, we're getting ready to leave. You ready? Huh? Let's go, bro. Come on. All right, let's get up. Nah, bro. I am right. No, man, I can't let you do that. Everyone here is drunk. Ready to go? Right, come on. Get off. Can you hold that. Come on, man. All right, bro. Come on. Let's roll. Ready? I got you. you ready, Claire? Yeah. Bye, guys. We're almost there, come on. Claire, you wanna grab the door? Yeah, for sure, Colin. Oh. Ray, you have to get up. Bro, are you good? Hey, Colin. Yeah, bro. Hey, I'm really sorry. I, I bet your shoes are like soaked right now. It's yeah. no big deal, man. Uh, you, should, you should let me drive. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, bro. Nah. Uh, hey. Hey, Colin, I need you to pull over. Get him in there, Colin. Yeah. Oh my god. Bro, are you okay? Dude, I'm fine. Look, I know you're tired. I just let me just let me drive, dude. That's not a good idea. Dude. No, I'm I just fine. saw you check out. Colin, it doesn't matter who drives. Like I sure? really have to get home. Just let him drive. It doesn't matter. It's not hey, that far. Dude, I'm doing this for Claire, but if you crash the truck, I'll kill you. I'm fine. Let's All just right. go. Right. Now, hurry, get okay. in the car. Here you go. Thank you. Right, here you go. Eat up a little bit. We'll be home in five minutes. Love you. Love you too. We're almost there. You don't need to be frustrated. I don't care what you do after. Emergency. Uh, my my friends are hurt. There was there was a wreck. Okay, where are they at? Mid Mid City's a precinct across from Birdville. Okay, is anybody injured? Uh, my my friend, she's she's pinned. There's a lot of blood. Okay, can you tell can you tell if she's well? What, is she breathing? Is she awake and breathing? She's she's not moving. She looks unconscious. Okay, she's unconscious. She can't respond to you at all. No. Okay, we're gonna get somebody started that direction. Okay, can you 
Is, is, is anybody else an injured besides her? Uh, my, my friend's in the back seat. He's, he's not moving. He looks unconscious. He's unconscious also? Okay, we're going to get somebody that direction, all right? Okay, what is your name? My name's Brady. Do you have your driver's license with you? Do you have a driver's license? Yeah. Okay, come on over here. Come around here. Uh, we're going to Colin's house. Oh, okay. Now, uh, the other officer said when I walked up that y'all been drinking and you had some drinks? Yeah. Okay. About how many do you think you had? Uh, I don't know. I was pretty drunk. Oh, man. Uh, all right, tell you what. I need you to come over here with me. What I'm going to do is do some tests on you, okay? I'm going to make sure that you're uh, okay to drive, all right? So, I need you to put your feet together. Put your feet together. All right, keep your hands out of your side. Now look up at Keep your hands still. Keep your hands still. Keep your hands still. And walk back along that same line. You're being placed under arrest. Is that? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Her parents are just hurting me. I know it hurts me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you have a point in your pockets? Uh, there's a key in my left pocket. Key in your left pocket? Uh, Go and spread your feet apart a little bit for me, please. Perfect. Do you have a knot to it, please? 
and have a seat. We'll be with you in just a moment, okay? Hey, Mom, this is Brady. I got arrested for drunk driving. All right, there's the video, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, before we move on, I'd like to give a special thanks to Hannah Weiss. She, we accidentally forgot her in the credits. So can we give a, a round of applause to Hannah Weiss? <laughs> <laughs> um, she was basically doing everything yesterday and, and today, so thank you. Um, really quick, just to give context on the video, um, the main characters, uh, Claire Anstey, Brady Gore, Colin Emmerman, um, Audrey Aaron and Caleb, not Caleb Hidalgo, uh, Caleb Nichols, sorry. Um, they all went to a party. A couple of them went under the influence. Um, obviously, Brady was the drunk driver, crashed to the other one. Um, fortunately, Audrey passed away, which is Caleb's girlfriend. Um, and so that's where they had like that heart to heart moment with his mom. And also, Claire, who, if you know who Claire is, she lives, breathes, and dances dance. And to have to see her like emotionally have that ripped away from her and having to live with that, um, I really thought gave it like that natural effect and that raw emotion. Um, next, uh, for our program today, uh, we have Officer, oh not Officer, no, we have Mayor Trevino. Where is, where is he at? Oh, over here. Can we please give a thank you and a round of applause for Mayor Trevino. Well, that's emotional, isn't it? That is tough. You know, um, I know it's a program, and I know it's not real, but you guys can't imagine how real it is, and it does happen, and it happens way too often. North Richmond Hills is a city of 70,000 citizens. It happens way too often. Our, your parents, y'all know people that that's happened to. You've got to do everything you can so it doesn't happen to you. I want to introduce our chief of police, Jimmy Perdue, uh, public safety director. Uh, Jimmy, thank you for joining us. <laughs> and I want to thank you for allowing me to say a few words today. First, I've got to say thank you to Burble High for holding the Shattered Dreams program. Um, I feel it needs to be done throughout the school district uh, at our three main high schools. And um, I know RPD is, and, and the city is willing to help on, on both Richland, Birdville, and I know Haltom would help at, at Haltom High. Um, I know it takes a lot of time and effort but it's a very important message that we, could sh we should not take lightly. And it's not something <clears throat> that we can tell you about. We can't talk to you about it. We can't talk down to you about it. We can't talk from our experience about it. Y'all got to talk about it yourself. The way y'all did it, uh, Jeremiah, the, the way y'all worked it through your, your own peers is what's so important about this. Um, thank you to the teachers, the counselors, staff, but most importantly, the students 
who were so involved in the program. And of course, I, I gotta thank the North Richmond Hills Police Department and our fire department for their participation. Uh, while the mock accident and video are very impactful, nothing comes close to the reality of the situation. When a friend or family member is badly injured or killed in a car accident. You know, y'all y'all talked about alcohol in this program, and I understand that alcohol uh, is a main cause of a lot of these incidents, but as of late, texting is as or more prevalent as the cause of the accidents or some other distraction. Uh, Whataburger cup spilling or you're eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich and you're paying attention to your, what's in the bag instead of what's in front of you or inside of you. It's tragic, but it's oh so preventable. We feel that if just one of y'all makes the decision to not drink and drive or not text and drive, this program's worth it. I hope it's a way more, uh, it's way more than one of you. I hope it's all of you. None of our first responders want to cut you out of a wrecked vehicle or to notify your parents when you fail to make it home. None of your family members should be having to say, they knew better than to do that. Or to say, they promised me they weren't going to do that. Or to say they were supposed to know better. Most of y'all think it won't happen to you, but it can happen to you in a heartbeat. It happens to, to people like you far too often, and that's why we're here today. You know what the good news is? That you have the power to make the right choices. If you or someone who's driving you has been drinking, don't risk it. If somebody's texting and driving while, while you're in the passenger side, it doesn't matter if it's your mom or your dad. Say, can, can that wait? Because I'd like to make it wherever I'm going safely. If you've been drinking and you need to get somewhere, call a friend, call a parent. When I was growing up, we didn't know what We'd had no clue what an Uber was, but y'all do. Use it. Utilize it. We used to have to call a taxi, and it would take forever to get a cab to show up. Please don't forget that distracted driving is also a very real problem. Basically, allowing your, your attention to be diverted even for a split second, and y'all y'all know, You've done it in a parking lot. You've done it out in the street. All of a sudden, you look up and go, oh, wow. What just happened? Those little early warnings are very critical because they should remind you, man, i got to stop this. That text message can wait or that call can wait till you get to your destination. I know you guys are, y'all are, I won't even say practically grown up. Y'all are adults. Some of you may be thinking, I don't need this guy to be here telling me what to do. But you got to remember that driving is a privilege. It's not a right. Your parents don't have to let you drive. They can take that privilege away if you break their rules. The police and the courts, they can take that privilege away if you break the law. The best way, and, I, and it's hard to say, the best way to show others that you're on your way to becoming an adult is to take the risks of driving seriously. And it's hard to tell you that because you know your parents do it. You know that everybody does it. We've got to work as a, as a society to stop that. We've got to wait because there's too many people dying. Always remember, you have the power to make the right choices. So do it. And thank you for doing this. Uh, again, it is so important what y'all have witnessed and what y'all have done the last couple of days. I'm proud of y'all for what you've done. Thank you.
much. Thank, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Trevino, for those wonderful words. Um, I kind of wanted to give my own little testimony for what happened last night. Um, I didn't really talk too much last night. Kind of give that them their time. Um, and so this is really like towards y'all. Um, I really did enjoy last night. And I try. I kind of said it this morning. This has been like a project all year long. Um, before the school year has actually started, we started meetings about it back in, I don't know, July. Um, and so it was really, really nice to see that I may have impacted somebody, um, whether it be one of you or anybody else who saw the crash scene. Um, and it truly did bring reward, I guess you could say, um, to all that hard work, even if it was just one. Um, and so, and again, I'd, to the whole student body, I challenged them um, to try to open the conversation about drink driving and also just distracted driving in general. Um, the reason why it's so bad and it's such a problem today is because we are so desensitized to it and we joke about it and we think it's just something that we can play around with. Um, you know, because sometimes that is the way that we cope with things and I think that we can do better and that we just simply need to open the conversation so we can save more lives. There's no reason why there should be somebody on precinct who gets in a car crash because they didn't get an Uber. Um, next, we have a, our last guest speaker for today. Um, can we please give a round of applause to Tim Rogers, who is the chief of the law enforcement incident team of the Tarrant County Criminal District Attorney. <laughs> Good morning. So as you said, I am a, I'm a prosecutor at the criminal district attorney's office, and so I come at this with a little bit different perspective than a lot of what was shown up here on the screen. Uh, because in my world, I take over and start viewing these incidents after Brady got arrested, right? I am looking at a lot of what took place in this whole incident in hindsight. And I will tell you, and I think Chief Purdue will probably echo a little bit about uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to say in that I've been doing this for about 18 years. And what seems most tragic about these kind of crimes, and it is a crime, and these kind of incidents, these kind of tragedies, is how absolutely preventable they are. And this whole theme about choices, um, it truly is about not just one choice, it's not one incident, but it's a whole line, whole host of choices made over the course of that whole evening that led to what happened. And it's one of the few crimes I've seen in my career where we don't have, you know, it's not like the robberies and the assaults and the things where we think they're just really bad people doing things to other really bad people. We truly have innocent, innocent people who make choices and hurt and destroy the lives of other innocent people. And those choices just lead to all lives destroyed. There are no winners, everybody loses, all because of these choices. As I told y'all, my, my world kind of takes over once Brady got arrested, right? We saw Brady get arrested and he got booked into jail. And that first night, things are gonna start to sink into him, the reality of his future. It's not about the, the tragedy of what happened. That's done. He can't change any of that, right? Somebody's dead. His friends are dead and severely injured. And at that point, it's a reality of what's next for him. The cost. The cost to his future. Y'all think, y'all, anybody have a hard time telling your parents you just wrecked the car? Is that scary? What about everybody uh, worried about having, think your parents are kind of cheap? I understand some of y'all have parents in the, in the audience, so... <laughs> Uh, worried about maybe asking your parents for $20, $30 just to go out? You're, right, you're, brave, you're brave people. You can raise your hand right here if you want to, right? Right. Now imagine having to ask your parents for about $15,000, $20,000. That's about the minimum it's going to cost for you to have to defend yourself for a crime as, as small as just DWI. That's just driving while intoxicated. If we're talking about something as serious as killing somebody while driving while intoxicated, could be a whole lot more. And that's just the money cost. And so, you know, when we talk about the choices made, and it's real easy for some people to think, well, I didn't mean to. 
I wasn't meaning to go out and get drunk. I wasn't meaning to hurt anybody. I will tell you all from the law perspective, from a prosecutor looking at it, that doesn't matter. There's no, I didn't mean to, I meant to do this. Not like assault or other crimes like that, I meant to do this. If you are intoxicated and you drive and recklessly hurt or kill somebody, that's a crime. It's done. And you could be labeled a criminal. And when you look at what it was worth, just for the fun of one night, just to let off some steam, have some fun with some friends, that's just the beginning of the cost to you. For what? And that's what this program is so great about. It's about educating y'all that hopefully in that moment when you have to make those choices, you think about what the consequences could be. But that fifteen to $20,000 is just the tip of the iceberg. It really is. When you're, after that arrest and a case gets filed by police officers like Chief Purdue or, or the officers on the scene, then it lands on the, on the desk of a prosecutor like me. And we just start looking at what it takes to, to prove a case. And, you know, there's been talk a lot about uh, wasted. Brady said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty drunk, I'm pretty wasted. But to be honest, there's a whole lot lower standard for when you're breaking the law while driving. Anybody know what the standard is as far as the number? We've all heard this, right? For, for alcohol, driving drunk? 0 0.08, right? For adults, okay? So there's a distinction, right? If you're breaking the law by driving with any alcohol in your system, if you're under 21, but if we're talking about the definition of intoxicated, it's 0 0.08. But the truth is, y'all, there's another definition of intoxicated, and that is if you are just not normal, mentally or physically because of alcohol in your system or drugs, then you're legally intoxicated. Which is kind of the point, right? That's why you're doing it. Not y'all. I know y'all wouldn't do it. Your parents wouldn't do it. That's why people do it. That's why the, that's why the kids in the, in the uh, video were drinking. That's why they were doing drugs. Is to feel different. Well, the moment you feel different and you're driving, you're breaking the law. And if you kill somebody doing that, driving recklessly, You've now committed intoxication manslaughter, and that is a second-degree felony, and you can get up to 20 years in prison for that. If you think it's hard to be without your phone for a night, 20 years is a different story, right? So when your case comes across a prosecutor's desk, you know, it's, it's real easy to think of yourself as, hey, you know what, I'm a good person, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good kid. Uh, I get good grades, I'm, I'm popular at school, my parents say I'm awesome, so I must be, right? My grandparents say I'm super awesome. I've got a lot of friends. To a prosecutor, your file on that desk is going to be about a person who made the choices that took someone's life. And what the mayor said is true, it is just too, too easy not to to make that choice these days. And what that choice boils down to is selfishness. So that prosecutor, while your parents may see you as the greatest thing in the world, and you no doubt are, the prosecutor sees you as a person who put the public at risk and took a life. And that prosecutor can't talk to y'all. We can't talk to you, your lawyer does all that. The $20,000 $20, lawyer does all that. What we talk to is the family of the person who's gone. We talk to the family and hear about how they don't get to have that person around for holidays anymore. They don't get to have that person around for their birthday. We hear about the hole that's left because of the choices you made because you wanted to have three or four hours of fun, of feeling good, and made the selfish choice to drive home because you didn't want to get in trouble by calling your parents. Or Uber, I'm an echo of what the mayor said. We didn't have Uber when I was a kid. You called your parents or you walked, or you risked it. In the end, what it boils down to is it's too late for Brady at that point. His choices were made, the consequences are there, and the case is done. There are two parts of a criminal trial. Do y'all know that in Texas? First part of the trial is about just did he do it, right? And the second part of the trial is about punishment. And I was thinking about uh, coming 
to talk to y'all, and I, th I was thinking about closing arguments and punishment. Y'all ever seen a closing argument, like on TV, stuff like that? Best thing in the world. I want you to imagine being in a week-long argument with your boyfriend or girlfriend or brothers or parents, and at the end of the argument, you could tell the person you're arguing with, sit down, be quiet, and I'm going to tell you for 30 minutes why I'm right, and you can't say anything. That's closing arguments in trial. It's wonderful. Wonderful. But in closing arguments and punishment, what I realized in thinking about this, my closing arguments in all these kinds of cases, in intoxication, manslaughter, and things like that, end up being about the choices that that person made. Because those choices reflected selfishness. And that selfishness reflected character. And those choices are what tell a jury what punishment they should give that person. Good, bad, or ugly, that's the reality of it. That's the reality for Brady at that point. It's too late because of the choice he made earlier in the night. How many of y'all like to hunt? Go shoot, anything like that? Everybody's like, no, no. The consequences of a felony conviction are permanent. And I ask about being able to hunt. For example, one of them is you can never possess a firearm away from your house ever again. And I, I bring up hunting because we're in Texas. We like to hunt, right? Never again. That's done. Better learn how to use a bow and arrow. Voting, never get to vote again for the rest of your life. Permanent you're convicted. Best case scenario if you're convicted of intoxication and manslaughter is you get probation. But it's still a felony conviction. And you could get up to 20 years in prison. So when we think about those choices that are made, knowing now everything that comes after that, how on earth is that three to four hours of fun worth the risk of those consequences. And so that's what I love about this program and what it shows you about those immediate consequences of that day and the loss of life and the loss and the suffering of all the families. But the Brady himself also has so much coming for him and so much to lose. So how was that choice ever worth the risk? I'll tell you on all the horrible things I've seen in, in, in 18 years of doing this and all the photographs of crime scenes and things like that. The pictures that haunt me the most, and there's one picture in particular, it's from an intoxication manslaughter case, and it was two 16-year-old girls who were driving to prom. And they were all dressed up in their prom dresses, and they were on their way. And it, it just, it struck me so hard watching this because the car driven by those two young girls was T-boned by other people going to that same prom who had been drinking ahead of time and were intoxicated. And inside this car were just those two little girls, and one had been knocked over onto the other one, and they were killed instantly. And it was like they were just sleeping on each other with blood coming from their noses and their mouths. And it's the most haunting thing I've ever seen in my life. Because it was so preventable, and they were truly innocents. I can't thank everybody involved in this enough for putting on this program, because it is knowing the consequences and thinking about those consequences in that moment that make it real and make it necessary for y'all to understand in those moments to make the right choice. And it doesn't stop just with y'all and the people watching in the classrooms, it's sharing that information. Birdville is awesome to put this on, now it has to be shared everywhere else. Social media, everywhere else. The way you can reach out to other people is awesome. So I truly, truly thank you all for allowing me to be here. Uh, it, it's, it's a great thing, and please be safe out there, y'all. Thank you. Oh, wait. Um, so kind of give uh, something that happened last night off of that topic. Um, some of our questions were about probation and I think there's a very common misconception in our age group about probation. My conception about it was wrong. 
Um, did I say conception? Oh, yeah, I guess, my bad. Um, <laughs> perception. <laughs> um, uh, ba- basically, we think that, like, oh, okay, you know what, we're going to go into probation. We you know, maybe six months, six weeks, whatever, you know, it'll be, and then we get off. If it is a felony, even if you serve out that probation, that's it. Like, you don't get to vote, you don't get to have uh, arms, like, it's just, not arms, sorry, firearms. Um, and it's, it's like your rights are stripped away from you. You are no longer an American citizen. You were born on American soil who were not an American citizen because you have practically no more rights. You have killed somebody or were charged with something high enough to get a felony. And there are multiple cases where people who go down this lane for probation and it's say 10 years, it gets in the ninth year, ninth month, ninth day, and then they mess up once and they either have to start all the way over or fill those 10 years of prison that they were first given in the beginning. Even if it is just a DWI, it can still lead down to a worse path. And don't think that, oh, okay, I'm not gonna kill somebody, I'm just gonna go drive, maybe I get pulled over and get a DWI, it's my first one, I'm not gonna get that bad of, of a write-up, right? It ruins everything. It's our, the misconception of it is so great that I'm like almost like scared for like the whole generation because it's, it's actually so wrong the way we think of it and that I really, really want you to, to know that that's, it's not the way that we think it is. Like our life is over, like it's done. Like you don't get a second chance. Um, well, with that, of my experiences, um, I'd like to open the floor to everyone on the stage for their own experiences and things that they would like to share with the rest of the student body. And first is Trista Torres. Hi, my name is Trista Torres. I am a junior over here at Burtville. Hold on, let me get in the camera real quick. Okay, hi. Um, What my experience was my freshman year is that I didn't really comprehend what was this driving thing of shattered dreams. Now that I'm a junior, I can figure out my experiences a little bit more. And I want to say to like freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors is that it's it occurs. You could be in the car with your friends. You could see like what happens. And as a living dead, I saw what happens to like friends and other people that are surrounding you. Like, I can't say anything to you. I can't talk to you. I am just a living figment of your imagination, essentially. And I would just like to say that it's a riptide that affects everyone. And I would love to be in this program. It's great. And yeah, that's really all I have to say. Hello. Uh, Is this too loud? All right, um, my name is Barrett Hicks. Uh, I'm, I'm a senior here, and I was uh, living dead. And I think the, the biggest thing that I took away from this, and it's something I thought about all day, um, I work with some of the, uh, like, I go, I'm in class with some of these people a lot. Like, there's seven of us on ROTT battalion staff here. We all have, like, huge aspirations of what we want to do in the future with stuff about military or fire academy or all that stuff. And, like, we talk about that all the time. And, um, and I was like, if these are the people that are gonna, if these are seven of us that wanna do this, I think everyone has probably some huge goals that they have. And talking with them last night, I learned that they did. And um, you know, it just kind of hit me that like, you know, like anything can really happen. Like, I mean, three lives in the, the film up there were ruined yesterday. Someone was killed, someone was paralyzed, and someone was arrested. Like, that's three lives, three dreams just completely uh, like destroyed and like me personally I I've faced a lot of challenges but I've made it through but that's something that's like really hard to almost impossible just to make through and uh, another thing that I was thinking about last night it was late last night um, I think one of the officers that was there was talking about our siblings and stuff and like how some people in here have younger siblings and they're watching us right now I have an older sibling who's actually done this who's actually seen this twice and um even now, like, 
he's 21, but like I still worry because he's off at college and he's two hours away. And like if he gets into an incident like that, like it's gonna suck because me, my mom, my dad, we're just real, we're far, and like I'm about to go off. I'm about to be four hours away, and I'm gonna be far if I get in something like that. So that like kind of hit me. I was like, it just sucks. Also, these are some awesome people up here. Um, hi, I'm Brady Lee, and I just wanted to talk about, so I just wanted to tell you, like, when you get a DWI, all of your dreams are gone. Like, I'm currently pursuing a cosmetology license. I would never be able to be a hairstylist. I would never do, be able to pursue my career. If you're getting a degree in college, that is completely like wasted. If you have a nice job, gone. If you are planning a nice vacation, no, you're you're gone. Like all your dreams are literally shattered. So next time you get drunk, think about it before you start your car and drive on the road. Thanks. Hi, hi I'm Megan Pittner. I am a junior and I was a living dead. I think I've always been kind of like different from other teenagers because I've always known that I wasn't invincible. I knew anything could happen to me at any point in time and that's what this is for. It's to show you that anything can happen. And unfortunately, it seems like several people didn't take it seriously. It was really hard for me because I was walking around the school and I saw living dead getting messed with because they couldn't respond. At the crash scene, there were kids laughing, joking about it, applauding at the end. And then in one of my classes, someone's name was called over the intercom, they had died, they cheered. So I just want to tell you all that this is really important and even though that crash scene wasn't real, there's one every day that is. And we need to do everything we can to keep it from happening. Hi, my name is Charlie and I'm a senior this year. And um, I come from a really big family. My siblings are probably the most important thing in the world to me. And when my sister was in high school, um, she was in the Shattered Dreams program, and I just remember watching that as a kid and how much it affected me. I told them this last night, it's kind of a secret, but every single time I get in the car, I say a quick prayer to myself, literally every single time, because that video just like impacted me so much, and I just get kind of scared that something like that can happen, even if I'm not the one behind the wheel that is intoxicated or distracted. There are other people around me who are. and. Um, while I was on the retreat, since that impacted me so much, um, all I could really think about is my siblings while I was on the retreat. Um, my sisters mean the absolute world to me, and I feel like it's really easy for us to make stupid choices when we think it only affects us, because I can think back on times when I made choices and I've only thought about myself, but to really put myself in that position and think about like what would happen to my sisters if they were, were to find out that something like that were to happen to me, that would completely crush their world. And I feel like like it has been said before, to not be selfish about making those choices and to really think twice before you do something. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a senior here at Birdville. So you know, we're not in the knowledge of we die. We're kind of given a group. So we're kind of like, Am I gonna die, am I not? I had a friend die in every single class period. I got to fourth period and I'm in choir, my biggest class. And names, Jeremiah comes on the speaker and then he calls Carter Doty and Rachel Rawls. And then everyone turns around looking at us like, oh my God, you're dead. Then Jeremiah comes back on the speaker and he's like, never mind, it's, Carter Doty and Olivia, I'm sorry, I can't remember your last name. So I'm like, oh my God, I know I'm gonna die now. Like, I didn't know, I was unsure, but now I know. Now you're processing, okay, what class period am I gonna die in? 
are my friends in that class period? Like, how is that going to affect them? Because, I mean, my best friend, Audrey, she died in the car crash scene. And her boyfriend technically saw, like, witnessed her die. My best friend, Hannah, died first period. Barrett died second. Third period was Audrey. And, and then um, fourth period was Carter. And then supposedly me. And then it turned different. So it's like your life impacts so many different people. And you have to think about like what happens when you die. It's just really heartbreaking when you see people go through that. It's just kind of awful to think about like if you make a mistake by driving while drunk and you hurt someone or kill someone, you affect their families, their friends. Like you go to jail, you affect your family, your friends. And if you were an adult and you had kids or a husband, you affect their lives. And it's a ginormous ripple effect. And it's just an awful thing. So. I think you should really, really think about before you get in the car, am I stable enough to drive? Thank you. Hi, I was uh, one of the fire academy students that got, I got to ride in an ambulance and I was treating someone in my ROTC call-in uh, whenever you saw the splinting the arm in the video, that was me, so. Um, <laughs> I know, I did good. Um, anyways, but that was, it's interesting, it's very real, because that was my first time riding an ambulance. Like, I passed my fire academy, I'm in EMT, but that's, that's my friend Colin, and even though the injury wasn't real, I was, I was very concerned because, I mean, it looked like he had a bone sticking out of his arm and I was holding his arm and I was like, I really don't want to hurt him. And he gave a little fake scream and even then my heart like skipped a beat. Thanks. Um, and it's, drunk driving impacts a lot of people and I think a lot of people see first responders like police and firefighters as like the people that come to save the day but at the end of the day, we're human too as well. I know that police officers and military and firefighters, whenever you make a decision that affects someone else's life like that, we take it with us too. Um, and it, it does affect our lives. I know that I want to work for North Richardson Hills as a firefighter and I'm going to see a lot of things that are like the worst the world has to see. And drunk driving is so preventable. You can make better decisions and prevent that from happening and causing this ripple effect of all the first responders and all of the family and friends and all the people that you affect whenever you crash into another car, whenever you drunk drive. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So I was the person that was put into the care flight helicopter and that was really significant for me because whenever they put all the stuff on my legs, they said, well, I, I was complaining about how it was heavy and they said that I wouldn't usually be able to feel it and that made me really reflect on like how in a split second, like being paralyzed, like I literally like 30 minutes was walking before and like in that moment, like from there on, I would never feel that again. And again, like dance is like everything to me and like, I think like in the video, like it also showed like I was really stressed out of like a competition and like missing it. But I think like the idea of losing something so important because of a stupid decision, like like drinking and driving was like, like I really felt that. And I think it really made me reflect on like the intent behind all of our decisions and like entering into college and stuff. Like I feel like we can get kind of flighty and not fully put thought into everything we do. And this experience made me realize like, everything we do matters, like even the small things, like we have to think about it. Something my parents have always told me is it takes a lifetime to build a reputation, but a second to destroy it. And I feel like this process really highlighted that for me. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Hey, I'm Colin. We've thrown around the word desensitized a few times last night and today, and uh, we talked about it yesterday, but at the hospital, a few hours before we were there filming, 
before our fake drunk driving accident, a family with a teenager actually at NRH Hospital, or Medical City North Hill, sorry, but uh, a kid passed away from a drunk driving incident, so it made it kind of like real, and obviously we laughed about it because James, the uh, EMS instructor, went over there and was like, hey, are you guys the shattered, oh, and had to come back to us, and he told us about that, and it was it was funny, but it was pretty sad, and it made it real for me and, a few, you know, everybody else up here. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. I'm Liliana. I was part of the... Um, film, AV, and editing crew for the Shatter Dreams. Um, this is my first time working on something this big and just being able to be behind the scenes of everything, seeing everything happening in real time. Everything was done as professionally and realistically as they could get it. <coughs> and something that one of the um, EMTs in the hospital said was that, okay, just imagine this, but a hundred times faster. And just hearing something like that, whenever it's already going so fast, you can't imagine what is going through people's heads whenever they're experiencing something like that. And I just want to thank, uh, thank everyone here today for taking the time out of your day to come see your amazing kids, uh, what they worked on today. We all work so hard <laughs> to make this for you guys and make this for everyone, the kids, adults, and everyone else who will be able to see the video, hopefully spread awareness. Don't drink and drive. Don't drink if you're under the age. Don't drive under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or anything. If you're tired, don't drive. It's not worth it. Your life is so much more important than you think it is. And just anything can happen in that split second that you would never realize. It could change your life, end it, and change everyone's lives forever. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brady Gore. Um, I was obviously the drunk driver in the video. Um, and I wanted to come here and try and say something a little bit different because it's hard for highly emotional people to communicate with people that haven't really felt the impact of something directly. Like we all just spent a night at the North Ocean Hills Rec Center like debriefing and crying and sharing very personal things. <laughs> um, and everyone sitting in the audience and watching on the live stream hasn't done that. Um, and you look up here at all these people trying to tell you like don't drive, like we just had this traumatic experience. Um, and you should believe us, <laughs> you should just not do it. And it's tough to communicate things like that to people, but I just wanted to share a little bit of what I felt in the cop car to give a little more perspective. Um, it was a little more surreal, I kind of shared with them last night, just like looking out the window as I'm driving to the police station, and I see Walker Creek Elementary School, and I see a bunch of small children running around, and all I can think is statistically, one of these kids will pass away, and they'll pass away at a very young age due to a drunk driving accident. Um, and that, it was hard to look out that window and go that way. Um, I started thinking a lot about the time that you can't get back from accidents like this. There's a lot of people out on the road every night that have dreams that just got into the college they want to go to. They're going to be engineers and musicians and all the people sitting here with big aspirations that, as we were told last night, are the leaders of tomorrow. And when you take someone's life, you take time away that you can't get back. Um, I think something I'd truly believe is that you don't know what you have until you've truly lost it and you can never get time back and there's something that's near impossible to comprehend about that from a human perspective. So in order to prevent such a tragic thing, just think twice about what you're doing. It's so easy to make this stuff just not happen. Thank you. Um, to talk about a couple things that Lily said earlier uh, about the um, amount of work that was put into it, it's also provided some context on that too. Um, the AV team and actors 
Um, we have been filming since the beginning of January, I think it was like that, or like the end of December, something like that. Um, Kyle and I tried to calculate some numbers the other day, and I think we spent about 32 hours of filming and like like 102 hours of editing. Like it was an insane amount. Um, not only just like going to somebody's house to like midnight or one o'clock, um, you know, just doing it on our side time. You know, Kyle really is, um, he's our head AV guy. Where's he at? Where's Kyle at? Can, Kyle, can you stand up really quick and give him a high five? <laughs> and if you're on the AV team at all, could you stand up please? Like this really would not be possible without you at all. Um, I can't I can't stand up here and take all the credit because it truly is not mine to take. Um, they really did put so much work into this, um, including the actors. So if you're an actor, please stand up. Um, just like video wise, they really were like the main people who put it all together. I mean, I. I wrote the script and that was about it. I just kind of sat there and was like, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. That looks good. Like that's like, I just sat there and like ate cookies the whole time. Um, and it, it really was uh, a really nice experience for me and hopefully them. Um, and I just wanted to let y'all know exactly how much was put into it. Um, we also have the real cosmetology and the real logistics crew. So if you could stand up. <laughs> Uh, I say real because um, I may or may not have lied to all of them about um, whether or not they were logistics or cosmetology. Um, in order, we keep the fact that if you're a living dead secret and so you get pulled out of the classroom, in order for me to do that, I had to find some way to tell them they were in the program but weren't in the program in the way that they were. That was a very, very, very weird thing to do and ended up me being like straight up lying to them. And so half of them I told were logistics, half of them I told were cosmetology. Um, and they truly, even though the big part of their contribution was just yesterday, I know a lot of them, it was very difficult not to talk during that whole day. You know, a lot of these people are um, very sociable people, and I know it was not easy just to kind of turn that off. Um, and so you could stand up if you're living dead. Boop, 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 boop. Um, a lot of them like stayed throughout the day, helped with some uh, cosmetology and logistics things. Um, and so, and last night we all went to the overnight retreat um, where we kind of did our own debrief section, uh, sections. And uh, we had a couple guest speakers and that's where I got like a lot of the information about the probation thing um, was from one of our guest speakers last night. Um, we also had a guest speaker with Officer Katara. So I forgot his name, what was his name? Officer, Officer Martin. Thank you. Um, he was really good. He, he kind of, the two ladies in the beginning came with a hard hitter. She was like, this happens, this happens, this happens, your life's over, blah, 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 blah. And like, his head is rammed us up. And then he kind of came in, which you would think he would be the one to hard hit her. And he kind of was like, like the soft one. Like he, you could tell he had like a real soft side to him. And so he, and he came in and he got us, got all of y'all to cry. I didn't cry, but they all did. And so, um, it was really, really nice to, for that experience. And so um, I'm, I'm thinking, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, oh, I'm forgetting, who am I? Oh, yes, that's what it is, yeah, yes. Um, so also, there, there was somebody else who came up here. I don't remember who exactly what it was, um, but they were part of the fire and uh, the fire squad. And so this year we tried to reach out to more and more um, kids who are part of different things in the school. Um, so this year we were, I was very, very happy and um, thankful to have the PD. So if you could stand up, the, oh, yes, 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 fire, fire, my bad, sorry, not PD, my, that's police department. <laughs> <laughs> um, they came in during the crash scene yesterday and they reenacted as if they were a part of the fire department and they did a fantastic job. They went through the exact same experience that everybody else did um, through the overnight retreat. And they really did kind of add a new perspective. Um, and I hopefully one of, one of them will come up, uh, one of the other two will come up to kind of give their perspective on it. Um, the living dead and crashing victims got the, you know, oh, my life's over, or 
now I've done this, I've caused this, and they really got that perspective to see it happen and not it truly affect you other than you just observing it. Um, and so would one of y'all like to come up and kind of share that experience? One of y'all too, maybe? Go. Yeah, there it is, there it is. <laughs> All right, um, my name's Anna Epperson. I'm a senior here. Um, it's my second year in the BISD Fire Academy. Currently, we're doing EMT stuff. But um, I had a different experience than most of them because I didn't technically die. Um, I did vehicle extrication, so I had to get a vehicle open to get my friends out, which was a very different experience. Um, I had a point of it where I was you know, doing my thing and then I look over and my friend is on a stretcher with a seat collar on. And I didn't think, I thought it was like prepared, I thought it was good, um, but it, it kind of like, it took me a moment to like recollect myself because it, it I mean, I wasn't expecting it. Um, and it, it just hit me different than it hit most of them because I was on the other side of it. But that's all I got to say. There we go. Okay. I already talked, but there's, there was a lot to process with the firefighting aspect of it, because this is the first year that Shattered Dreams brought the, uh, the fire cadets into it. Um, we went classroom to classroom pulling kids, and it was, it was interesting, because I, I read several obituaries, and we went in with the stretchers, but it's, it's very different whenever it's people that you know. It's your peers. You're going to the school. You'll hear it over, but there's something very surreal about reading the obituary for your friend, for someone that you, that, that you grew up with in high school, and you, it, it affects you, and the way that you see the class just goes silent and very somber whenever you're reading the obituary. Some people are crying. It's, it makes it very surreal, and going back to that ripple effect of, it's very preventable if you drink and drive, like, you, there are so many alternate options like Uber or call a friend or call a parent because um, it leaves a mark on everyone. And that's what I would say. Hi, guys. Okay. So as the Living Dead, we got to see a lot of different, like, perspectives. We kind of were just silent the whole day. Me and Berkeley were the first ones to get pulled out and die. So we got to say like three words the whole day. So we definitely got to see a lot of different perspectives. So the first perspective I saw was kind of being like the bystander. So during the crash scene, I was standing there with like the other living dead. I look to my left and I see Audrey's mom, which broke all of our hearts to see her reacting to her daughter laying on the ground, and it was such a real moment. But then we look to our right, and we see Audrey's best friend, Hannah. She was breaking down seeing her best friend lying there. And so just as a bystander, we, we saw their reactions, and it just it broke our hearts for them. Then we had a lot of guest speakers coming in, and we got some of their perspectives, you know. And one of their... Uh, stories that they told was the person who was driving the car. So they see a lot of people come in, but one ended up killing their best friend, and their best friend's family decided to not let them, or decided to not want them to go to jail. You know, they were like, you know what, they have to live with that. And he did. He lived with that, and he didn't go to jail. He tried to go through probation and everything, but he kept drinking. He couldn't handle that guilt and that weight and kept drinking, kept drinking, kept drinking. And they told us multiple stories about people who ended up killing themselves because of these drunk driving accidents. So that was that perspective. And then, you know, we saw the boyfriend or girlfriend perspective of seeing their significant other die. And just putting yourself in that perspective of seeing someone that you truly care about die because of a choice you made or a choice a random person made, like, it's awful. Just, like, imagine, like, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, 
someone made a stupid decision, a selfish decision, and now they're gone. And if you've lost someone, which a lot of people have shared they, they have, you know that hole that you feel, you know that loss you feel, and that's how they're going to feel the rest of life because you made a dumb decision or someone else made a dumb decision. So I feel like this really showed us living dead people a lot of different perspectives and really showed us to not just think about like us, but to think about every other person that is affected by this. Like even the cops, they shared multiple stories about how they still remember so many instances of these people dying and you don't even think about all oh, of these cops that showed up to these scenes, they're still affected by it too. So many people are affected by it. It's not just you. So think before you act. Thank you. Hello, I am Lauren Aswad and I was also a part of The Living Dead. And what impacted me the most was when they were reading our obituaries like after we got called out on the intercom and we were pronounced dead, um, it just like struck me that like your life is, it's like over. So everything that you've worked for, all the schoolwork and all the stress and everything that you've gone through is over. And so it just like reminded me that every day is a gift and a blessing. We're not granted tomorrow. So we can't take life for granted and just to show what's important to you in your daily life. So like if your family or your faith is what's important to you, that's what should be reflected in your everyday life. So it just made me like reconsider my perspective of like what's important to me and that's what I should be living out today. Thank you. Um, to to kind of talk about what uh, I think it was, uh, it was whoever went before Lauren, um, they were talking, sorry, who was it? Who was it? Okay, sorry, my bad, Katie. Um, she talked about, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, it's truth. We have lost people for whatever reason in the previous years at Burville. And I'm not going to go too deep into all the specifics on that. But I feel as a student body, we're so quick to talk about that, talk about how it affected me, how this, they were so close to me. Oh, I knew them like they were my best friend, blah, 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 blah. And we're so quick to open the conversation when it actually happens. And we're opening the conversation now, and we don't talk. We're not using the opportunity. We joke about it. We laugh at it. And it seems that only when it needs to be a life that's lost in order to take it seriously. And that's exactly why we do this, is so that we can prevent that. So, and I, and I know I said this earlier, but I, I truly, truly do challenge you to open the conversation. Because, there, again, there's no reason why. This is why we're doing this. And don't let the conversation up just because somebody passes away for whatever reason. There, is there anybody else who would like to talk? Oh, yes. Um, can we give a round of applause for Officer Katara? Wow. How was that for an emotional last 24 hours? Right? Parents too? Yeah. Um, first thing I want to point out is I'm pretty sure Jeremiah just called Officer Martin a softy. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, thank you for the parents. We really appreciate y'all going through this and allowing us to let your kids go through this. Uh, thank you to the students. We appreciate y'all for having this emotional last 24 hours that you will hopefully remember for a lifetime. Um, most of y'all I've been with for three to four years. Um, some of y'all since eighth grade. Um, some of y'all I just met this year. Um, y'all know me. I'm very open. I'm very approachable. I try to be. Um, sometimes I have candy. <laughs> sometimes I may have an animal in my pocket. Did I just use the mic? Okay. Um, you threw me off when you brought up the sugar gliders. <laughs> uh, yes, being approachable. I try to be a, as approachable as possible. Us as police officers, we're wearing that intimidating uniform. We have an intimidating gun. We have all these weapons on us. And you know, a lot of people are intimidated by that. I can remember some of y'all in eighth grade when I first came in 
and would approach y'all and talk to y'all, and y'all would literally look at me like, oh, my God, why is this police officer talking to me, right? <clears throat> We've come so far. How many of y'all hugged me within the last 24 hours, <laughs> right? A lot of y'all did. Um, Colin, I didn't see you raise your hand. Okay, All right, just making sure. Um, I try to be approachable, and I want to continue to be approachable to you, okay? I am your police officer. Parents, I am your police officer. Students out there that are watching the video, I'm your police officer. Treat me as your personal police officer. That's what they pay me for, right? I'm here at this school to provide a liaison between us and the police officer, between us and the real police officers, right? Um, because <laughs> I'm a fake cop, that's right. Um, um, use me, right? I'm a, I'm a school resource officer. I am your resource. If you have a question, you have a problem, you have something like that um, going on, give me a call. Call up to the school, ask for Officer K. I guarantee they'll, they'll get you to me really quickly. Um, I did so well last night, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, this is going to be, you know, what did I tell you all? What happens on the Internet lives forever? Dang it. <laughs> last thing I want to tell you guys, and it's still hard for me to say it because I truly mean it. Y'all hear me say it all the time. I love you guys. I truly love you guys. I treat you as you were my own kid, okay? I will continue to do that. Whenever you are faced with those decisions that you have to make in the next couple of days, in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of years, after you graduate, after you go on to college, think back to this instant. Think back to the memories and the experiences that you've had this week, okay? Make those good decisions. Make those right decisions, right? I've told several of y'all, y'all always hear me say it, I don't ask you to be perfect. I don't expect you to be perfect, right? Our parents, we want you, they want you to be perfect, but they don't expect you to be perfect, right? When you mess up, we just want you to do better next time. That's what we're asking you to do right now. The next time you're faced with one of those decisions, think about it. Do better. All right? I love you guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Miss Grossman. I just want to uh, begin to wrap this up. Students, thank you so much for your attention in class today. Um, we have some fantastic uh, peers of yours who want to share with you uh, their experiences. Um, they applied for this back last semester. Uh, the parents have been involved for months. Uh, they had an overnight retreat last night. And when you guys received those stickers in your classroom, uh, when the living dead were pulled, uh, we told you that one decision can have a ripple effect, right? So throughout the day yesterday, you just saw more and more stickers. So my challenge to you guys and to our students that participated is to, instead of having one bad choice have a negative ripple effect, make some good choices that will have a positive ripple effect, and we can really have an impact in our community. I want Jeremiah and Peyton to come up here so we can make sure we thank them. <laughs> Come on up. There we go. There we will get you in the oh. camera. Okay, these guys have worked so hard to put this program on uh, for the student body, and I am so immensely proud of them and the courage it takes to stand up here and talk to their peers. So let's give them a round of applause. We thank you so much. And at this time, uh, teachers, we want you to hold your class through the end of fourth period. So once um, we're now concluded with our assembly, 
and uh, will stay in your class until the end of the fourth period bell rings and then everyone's dismissed to fifth period. Thank you so much.